The following is an independently produced community access program. The viewpoints expressed are those of the community access producer and do not reflect those of Shaw Cable Systems. The program is presented in response to CRTC policy guidelines regulating community programming. Good evening and welcome to Your Turn. I am your host, Jenny Adams, and we are so glad that you could tune in this evening. After all, this is your show. It's about you. We can't wait to hear what you think about our conversation this evening. So please call us, text us, tweet us. We are so excited to hear what you have to say. I'm going to introduce you to our guest in just a moment, but for the first time ever, what I'd like to say is we are streaming live on YouTube, which is a really big deal for us. So youtube.com slash Shaw TV Edmonton and Ryan. Ryan, thank you so much for being here this evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you, I've got this really you, fancy uh, introduction for you, but oh. I, I just wanted to jump to the chase and say I'm so excited to have well, you in Well, thanks for bringing me in. Our guest this evening, Ryan Jesperson, host of the Ryan Jesperson Show on 630 Ched. You literally are one of the most engaged Albertans hmm. I know. You have your finger on the pulse of everything. You get paid to do that, but you also spend three hours a day talking to Albertans about literally what's going on in the news hour by hour, minute by minute. Um, for those who haven't had a chance to tune into your show, why don't you just tell them a little bit about it? Yeah, well, I mean, what what we do on my show, uh, weekdays from 9 to noon on 6.30, Chad. <laughs> the first of many times we we'll hear that. We shamelessly <laughs> plug ourselves. Yeah, of course. Uh, but, but we do, uh, we, we embark on an exercise every single day uh, that's not... Uh, dissimilar to what you're doing right now here live on Shaw, and that is identifying or working uh, to determine the issues that matter most mm -hmm. to Albertans, to Edmontonians. Uh, why do people care about these issues? Why are they significant? And where do people want to see that conversation move or travel? You know, we say in the introduction to our radio program every single morning, uh, sometimes knowing the headlines isn't mm -hmm. enough. You know, sometimes you've got to talk about it. And we're at a point uh, in our province's uh, industry uh, when we take a look at our political landscape, when we take a look at the economy, uh, both municipally and provincially and federally, uh, people have a lot to say right now. In other words, if I was Premier, if I was Prime Minister, yeah. this is what I would do. And so we do our best to, to, to sort of moderate that conversation. Well, and it's interesting that you say all that stuff, and that's exactly why we wanted to have you here this evening. When we were trying to decide who we should have in next, it's like, well, Ryan, you happen to know what so many people are thinking and feeling. So tonight when we talk about the city of Edmonton and Alberta's economy and some really great hot topics and then a lot about your life and your career, it's not just what you bring to the table, but also knowing what people are thinking in general. Yeah, and, that, and, that, and you've got to kind of pick your spots when you're, when you're a talk show host, as you know. Sometimes uh, people might be interested in what you have to say, and sometimes that adds a little spice to the conversation. And sometimes they call and you out on the spot. <laughs> sometimes you've just got to get out of the way and give people the floor and, and that's what makes it uh, such an interesting exercise and so when you say that that you you perceive me to be engaged I take it as a compliment I think I, I'm just probably uh, very similar to many of the people that are tuned in right now and that's just I care uh, about what I see around me and I care about the future for my son yeah. and, uh, and and sometimes I think that we, we try to find the most civil way uh, to find this discourse to, to uh, you know, pass some topics around, and uh, I'm looking forward to the broadcast tonight. Well, and we were laughing a little bit right before we came on air because Ryan and I were on the radio today, and I was like this half the time talking into the microphone. Yeah. And Ryan's running around the studio literally while we're talking and plugging in microphones, and I'm trying to, you know, carry the show. Whereas in TV, we're a little bit more prim and proper. We're aware that people are watching. They say us. you're supposed to be anyway. We're supposed to be, but you spent a lot of your career on breakfast television here in Edmonton. Yeah, that's right. How six years hosting six BT. Six years. Yeah, and uh, and it's nice to be back in a television studio again. I love that the, the team got a here face at Shaw. For TV, right? uh, oh, they, <laughs> they, they say sometimes I've got a face for radio and a voice for newspaper, but I try not <laughs> to take it too seriously. But but I like that you prioritize uh, you know this program and and uh, you know it's, it's great to be back in the studio. So the transition for yourself from TV to radio was that always a plan? Was that always something that you had in mind? Or Never how, a plan. How and and it's tough. I think if you if you asked anybody uh, that works in media right now that, uh, if they had a plan and they said yes and they mm -hmm. said that they've been 
following their plan to fruition through the course of their career, they would be lying to you because uh, media is just one of the industries that has experienced a great degree of change yeah. over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, not just how people uh, consume their media, but also the type of media that people are interested in. And, and what worked uh, 50 years ago certainly doesn't work now, but in some cases what worked five or 10 years ago uh, doesn't work now. So uh, not to say that we've stuck a fork in morning television by any stretch of the imagination, nope. but sometimes in life, when an opportunity comes in front of you uh, and presents itself to you, you've got to leap. And I was always, ever since I was a little kid, uh, sitting around the, the Sunday afternoon dinner table yeah. at my grandparents' house, always interested uh, in conversations that would dig. I, I, was, I, was, I tried to never be uncomfortable as a little guy in conversations where I was in over my head, yeah. just tried to learn, you know, and, it's funny, uh, Ryan, and that it you, worked. You mentioned when you were a little kid. Mm. Um, did you ever think that you'd have a career in politics? We've got a few photos that I wanted to show. Oh, do you? Yeah. And did you ever think you'd have a career maybe as a student council or? Oh, wow. Where <laughs> oh, did you this dig picture, that up? this picture Look with your that. mother. That is my mom, Catherine. That is your mom. Yeah, she's a, she's a school teacher by profession. Uh, she was the chair of the curriculum committee with the school board, I remember, down in Calgary. And she, uh, she put her teaching career on hold to raise us and now she's the office manager for, for our family business. Can we show the pictures of Ryan as a teenager? Look at that. Yeah, that is adorable. That's and toilet paper, by the way. This is the picture that I was talking about. Wow, I don't know if up. you can see in the background. But stop. Jesperson for freshman class president. Did you uh, win? I did win. I Yeah, and you know what? And, and that's actually, that's a very significant photo. Uh, aside from the unfortunately bleached blonde hair and the inexplicable goatee, uh, when I headed out there, I went to Trinity Western University in Langley, BC. We can yeah. talk about that later if you like. They're in the headlines, of course, now Supreme Court battles uh, looming for their law school that they want to open, and of course their teacher's college. They were in front of the Supreme Court about uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago maybe. Um, but yeah, I arrived at Trinity Western and I was, I was talking big game, joking around to a buddy that I thought I could, I thought I could win that election for freshman class president on the student <laughs> association. He said, well, you should run. I said, I will. And then I did win uh, and, uh, and, and said, of course, well, I've got to take this seriously now. And I wanted to represent my constituents mm -hmm. in that case, mm -hmm. the, the, the first year students at that university. And, uh, and right out of the gates, participating in the, in the student governance uh, model, uh, didn't like some of the news coverage we were getting in the student newspaper, the Mars Hill. Yeah. So I wrote a scathing letter to the editor uh, from my desk as freshman class president. And uh, not only did they run it, but they offered me a column and asked wow. if I'd like to contribute. And three years later, uh, I was editor in chief of that newspaper. Wow. And that's what started everything. Started then a job the at the Calgary Herald yeah. and then radio in Red Deer and then television in Edmonton. And, and so what you you're saying it. is you're qualified for the job that you have. Well, I don't, very know, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess anybody that, that is an engaged citizen is qualified to host a talk show. Uh, you know, there are different styles of, of talk show. I mean, we know lousy hosts when we mm -hmm. see them and we know great ones when we see them, but a lot of times the styles are different. I think what probably makes for a successful talk radio show or a talk show on television as well is an open-mindedness, an ability to to live and work in the gray areas. Mm -hmm. uh, some people feel that there is black and white, and in some cases there is, uh, but the gray areas is where you find the great radio. Well, and you do a really great job at um, reading the text messages as they come in mm -hmm. and, and talking on the phone. And sometimes when I'm listening to Ryan, I'm like, Ryan, please take more phone calls. These are entertaining as heck. And how do you balance the fine line of not knowing what people are going to say and reading these conversations as they come in live and producing the show at the same time? Yeah, well, it, it's, you know, you you have to prepare for three hours a day. And uh, sometimes you, you'll have a strong guest out of the gates, the first guest of the show. And you know that you could take calls for the remaining two and a half hours. You yeah. could. And uh, the, the risk lies in the situations where you predict that there will be massive audience response and that people will want to chime in. And there's just crickets you know it's it's perhaps a rarity but the odd guest just doesn't connect with the audience yeah. and 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 then if you don't have a plan in place if you don't have a contingency plan another guest book you can find yourself in hot water well I've heard you sometimes talking about the music on air and I'm like oh wow I think Ryan's a little stuck for something to say but yeah we, no never I was worried we never. were gonna not have enough things to talk I'm about never this wasting <laughs> airtime <ever. laughs> clearly we flew through that in yes. uh, a heartbeat coming up after the break we're gonna start talking about the city of Edmonton but reminder this is your chance to call in ask us questions We've got the city of Edmonton coming up next. After that, we're going to talk about the province of Alberta, and then we're going to get into some hot topics. So we can't wait to hear from you. We'll take a short break, and then we'll be right back.
Well, I mean, there are a lot of issues that are important. I think uh, if we look at the, the transit situation, it's a pretty important one just from all the, the traffic tie-ups that we have according to that. Bit of an annoyance, but I think it's a positive annoyance because it shows the city is developing, right? Probably the uh, trouble they've had on the LRT lines. I think that's a big issue. Edmonton is transforming into another type of a city. A lot of uh, newcomers are coming in. Um, uh, it's becoming a lot more urban, a lot more modern. I think the biggest problem that Edmonton is facing is homelessness. I feel safe and I feel there's lots of opportunities that anybody can create a job for themselves here. Of course, the revitalization of the uh, the downtown, the ice district, what we have going on there are good initiatives as well too. What are your thoughts on the new arena? Oh, love it. Love it. Yeah, it's beautiful. It looks really, really nice. I think it's a very exciting development because uh, even like I, I just came from Calgary, so everybody seems to be talking about that. Business owners around the area who are probably not attracting as many people at the moment because of the economy going down. Um, I'm excited for them because I'm sure that it will just attract the right crowd. I'm a smoker, so if I have to come out for a smoke, a concert, I'll stay for a whole concert, but a hockey game, no, I'd have to go out for a smoke, and if I'm not allowed back in, I won't be going to hockey games. Uh, we're going to uh, Amy Schumer in November, so that'll be my first look inside, so looking forward to it. I say this to all of my friends, to everybody, that Edmonton is not going to be the same today in 2016 and in 2020 or 2021. Welcome back. We're in studio this evening with 630 Chad's Ryan Jesperson, and we're about to talk about everything Edmonton. There were some really great comments in those streeter questions there. I love the smoking one for, <laughs> for Rogers Place. It is true. The smokers well, are the so smokers. upset about the no re-entry policy at Rogers Place. They very the, much are. I think they'll get over it. People are furious it, about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's protocol in, in arenas all around the world and other facilities, including concert halls, and uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a security thing as well. People mm -hmm. have to, if you're going to leave the arena, uh, well, rather, if you're going to enter the arena you've got to go through security screening including metal detectors and everything else and it's just it'll be a nightmare uh, trying to manage that I'm not certainly not the one that made the decision but I just you're not I just I just I'm not and I'm not trying to chuckle at people's concerns uh, no but, but it's just, changed like people, it's kind of it's something different making the I can't go for a smoke mm -hmm. uh, the number one issue about the new arena is just I don't know it's comical but Man. speaking of the arena and Edmonton transformation how exciting is the fact that the arena is now here and open. Yeah. And Could you imagine if we didn't do it? Yeah, I can imagine if we didn't do it. And, oh. uh, and, and, and it keeps me awake at night. I would be panicking and I'd be wondering uh, what on earth is going on because when we first moved up to Edmonton, when I moved up here 10 years ago, I was reading as best I could the material that I thought was relevant in making an important decision and that is uh, the purchase of a condo and and real estate was booming and everything was great this is entering 2006 and uh, Edmonton City Council at that time had just indicated its support to the tune of of tens of millions of dollars to the quarters development right. and there were pictures and artist mock-ups of these these sort of like Venetian uh, water canals and this pedestrian area and it was going to revitalize all of East Jasper Avenue and it was just going to be phenomenal and incredible and so we invested in that area and I don't have to tell you or anybody watching this program that we literally next to nothing has happened in East Jasper Avenue with the exception of a, of a hotel that's getting set to open and a couple buildings burning down mm -hmm. um, and, and 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 it blew my mind as a new Edmontonian at that time that there was so much uh, riverfront or river valley front property that, that was just being left essentially to rot uh, and left undeveloped and you could say the exact same thing of 104th Avenue North uh, in Edmonton's downtown which now the arena is great, and yeah. the and the arena is going to allow for a lot of things. But there there are there are billions of dollars of investment around the well, arena. And that's what I mean. And, I mean and office hockey. towers. And and, Love and hockey, you know, but, ask yeah. Calgary what happens when you invest in office towers. You attract corporate head offices and when you like when you put now. in the infrastructure when you invest in your downtown uh, and, and when government invests in downtown and I know this is where it gets contentious yeah. and controversial and this is why some people will never embrace Rogers Place uh, but you you attract private investment and and Edmonton needs to learn uh, to do more of that people talk about the quarters back to East Jasper Avenue to bring the thought full circle if there was more civic investment there then perhaps there'd be more private investment or well, we should talk about some of the other issues that some of our street or question folks Sure. Because I do believe that these are some of the issues that you listen to on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be the LRT or the news that we had today about the Walter Tail Bridge being delayed. Right. Do you think again? A, a, again, we, bridges are not a popular thing here in Edmonton. But do you think, on that note, that 
with a project like the Wal Walterdale Bridge, that is something where we've actually taken the time to invest in a beautiful end result where maybe there was, um, you know, miscalculation on how long that it should take, that we should have a little bit more patience for getting this right because at the end of the day, we're not just building something cheap and ugly like we always do. We're taking the time to do something that's a bit transformational. Well, and no Edmonton. one's, I mean, the first delay of the Walterdale Bridge, which was a significant one, was due to, to welding deficiencies and these 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 big uh, beams or whatever, the whatever they had these vulnerable welds that had been done, I believe, in South Korea, yeah. and uh, and they didn't believe that they were up to par, and they didn't believe that it was going to be safe, uh, and then there was going to be longevity issues with the bridge as well, maintenance issues. So, so of course, I mean, who's going to argue that you still open before it's ready uh, just <laughs> because you promised bridge. an opening right. date with yeah. a bridge? I mean, it's ludicrous to suggest that. However, uh, we have to believe that the city is competent and able to manage these projects, and right now, rightfully so. I think Edmontonians are lacking confidence in the city of Edmonton, not just city council, but city administration, city management mm -hmm. as well, and, and the overseeing of several city departments, including transportation, yeah. where we've seen hirings and firings. And it's not just based on a delay to the Walterdale Bridge. I mean, there are comical issues. They're not funny at the time. They're funny now. I mean, girders buckling on the 102 Avenue bridge. And we look at other delays, almost almost nearly every bridge project. And we haven't even started talking about so the LRT, which is a should, disaster. Should we have more patience for them? I patience? Mean, but what, I, you know, I don't know. We're, we're going through this growing was, pains. If you were paying, Listen to me. I'm trying to be the devil's advocate. You are trying to be devil's advocate. Agree, and I agree on a lot of Sometimes the talk show host yes. has to do this. Yeah. But if you were paying out of your pocket for your home to be renovated, and they told you that it'll be done by December 1st, just in time for you to host your family for Christmas, yeah. and it ended up being done 18 months after that December well, hey, 1st, would you just be patient? No. And I mean, I feel the most for the businesses on the 102 Street Bridge uh, on High Street, and, and no, numerous of them shut down because... Call the, the Kettle Canadian Black Bridge. was in Call business for 20 years and they closed. There were other businesses like, like the Carbon Boutique and others, there have been pubs and restaurants in that area that, that we're talking about entrepreneurs in mm -hmm. Edmonton that made good on their side of the equation, uh, and they invested their money and they opened their doors and uh, businesses uh, are reporting losses uh, to the tune of 60% in year-over-year -year revenue directly due to traffic the, flow yeah. and the closure, the extended closure of that bridge. There's a good argument to be made that the city should be compensating some of these business owners for their losses through I that period of time. I happen to agree on that one, but I mean, I don't know the, the rules of the city. Well, keep in mind, I mean, these contractors are, are paying out. I mean, some penalties are topping $10,000 yeah, a day, a day, a day, a day uh, right. where this goes beyond the delivery date, and that's revenue to the city. So so on that note, we've got lots of things that are happening in the city. It's growing. Uh, we're excited. We've got growing pains. We've got a civic election coming up a year mm -hmm. from now. What do you think the topic is going to be, the ballot question? What do, we, what do you think Albertans are, you know, are going to be more, sorry, Edmontonians? are going to be more interested in once we get to that stage. Well, I'll tell is someone you, going to win or, win or lose over the LRT or over a bridge? Or I saw something online the other day that kind of made me go, wow. And this is going to maybe come across as harsh, but this is the fact of the matter. Uh, Don Iveson, um, I'm an Iveson guy. I like uh, Don's leadership. I like his vision, but he is vulnerable. The legacy of, of his of his first couple of years in office, he's vulnerable yeah. on some fronts, and it doesn't help him that some of his big pedestals, some of his big priorities are things like a cyclable city and, and public transportation. But online the other day, he, he was having fun, uh, he and his wife at the Drake concert, right. and, and our mayor tweeted to Drake and, and kind of made a joke about can Edmonton be called the seven, because Drake calls Toronto the yeah, six. Yeah, yeah. And a prominent Edmontonian uh, who happens to be a cyclist, and I don't know if there's some vitriol behind this, retweeted it and said, remember Edmonton when we thought we were getting a cool mayor. Ooh, okay. And a whole bunch of people started passing that around and I went, hang on, whoa, like I kind of did a double take and I went, I'm pretty sure that if you look across Canada, Edmonton, and for that matter, Calgary and even yeah. Red Deer, there's there, and, and Wood Buffalo, I think you could include as well with Melissa Blake, there's kind of this corridor of young, savvy mayors that show leadership yeah. early in their careers and, and I and I don't think that, that Don has has broken from that trend or from that description, but but the fact that that tweet and that comment well, got that's some love even bigger conversation. made me wonder, I if some people, if, if the mayoral well, uh, legacy is losing its luster. We've got a call regarding the mayor, so maybe we'll grab it right now. What's our caller name? It's Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Catherine O'Neill. Hi, oh, Jenny. Hi, Catherine. 
Hi, Catherine. I wanted, I wanted to ask you, Ryan, who do you think will run in the race next year for mayor? Oh, wow. Do you think there's going to be a contest? And if you had some names you've been hearing, and I mean, I don't want you to put them out there, obviously, but do you think there's going to be a race? I, well, I mean, do I, I, here's the thing. I think that people will challenge Mayor Iveson, and, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised, though I can't guarantee it, I wouldn't be surprised if one of them is his council colleague, Mike Nickel, who has sought the mm. mayor's chair before and who just strikes me as, as one that, that, that is primed for that run. Mike's made a lot of noise uh, as a city councillor. And, and it, along the lines... Do you think he's a... I'm not comparing okay. the personalities. Okay. Yep. He's not the second coming of Kerry Diot, uh, but but <laughs> Mike grabs the attention and the allegiance of of the fiscal hawks, yeah. uh, of the ones who call it how they see it, and of those who lean a little more center right or right. And 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 you know I, I I'm I'm hesitant to to uh, predict whether or not Mike might give Don a run for his money because off the top of my head, uh, Don achieved about 135, 138 thousand votes and. And, and Kerry Diot, I think, was around the 30, 35,000 yeah, mark. Yeah, dominated So, so you, you have to wonder, but, but I don't think that all of Don's votes uh, from last election are guaranteed to come back his way. Okay. Catherine, thank you so much for that call. We really appreciate you calling in. We do also have a Twitter question that we should get to. Yeah. We'll bring the Twitter up on the board. Why spend money on a new arena instead of revitalizing Northlands? Well, your thoughts, Ryan? Well, it looks like we are going to revitalize and you retrofit think we actually and are? refurbish Northlands anyway. Not uh, to that, the extent that that's they would what like. A lot of it, well, it depends how big of a conversation you want to have True. right now. If you want to talk about... Uh, about In about uh, 45 seconds. Okay, but, if yeah. you want to talk about collapsing Northlands as an organization, rolling it into Edmonton Economic Development Corporation, mm -hmm. uh, and, and stopping these two groups from competing against one another, I think that's the best move. Now, what would that mean for Northlands Coliseum? I don't know. I Northlands think it's board. foolish to put $250 million Million dollars in the Northlands Coliseum if you can't predict payoff for it but you talk to hockey families they say we need the ice if it means six new rinks great I know I like that part of it. that part of town that though including the neighborhood of Highlands had a long time to see activity from the arena being and there and I'm not happened. convinced that it's worth the investment I'm, and I'm, it's not a shot at that neighborhood I love that part of town yeah. but I'm not convinced that's where we I, and I don't think you're gonna draw investment to the tune of three billion dollars from private no. investors well, we as didn't. well we didn't up until this point well thank you for that we're going to um, have a short break this is so much fun. I'm so excited to have you here in studio. Coming up next, um, our city is changing, but our province is changing, changing and it's changing drastically. And uh, we're going to discuss some of the hot economic topics when we come back after the break. Hi guys, I'm Douglas Mitchell. I'm with Edmonton Unplugged. Now we're a local show in Edmonton that likes to showcase the talent that is around. You come on our show, you play. Do a little interview. So he was dating my sister. Either way, if you'd like to be on our show, we would like you to get a hold of us at info at edmontonunplugged.com. And we will listen because we care. for the economy if they really think that it's going to boost it um, if the money is going to be reallocated somewhere else great not a problem do it but i know that a lot of people are very against that i don't think there's any other good way to do that whether you tax it at the source or at the uh, on your utility bill or you tax it through uh, through corporations or otherwise but uh, as a as a means to try to get to the the goal of you know sustainable development and reduction of that that's probably one method uh, Good or bad, I don't know. I can't really say on that. Let's we'll see what my bills look like. We just have to, I guess, trust the government that they would reallocate the same taxes or the money that they're accumulating to a good, uh, for good purposes. I guess it's a good thing. I guess the counter argument is that, well, everyone just raises the prices a little bit. So, you know, but there should definitely be a, a living wage for people. You know, it isn't like if you're making minimum wage, you should just barely be able to get by. That seems 
fair. Yeah, I think minimum wage conceptually is a great idea. Uh, concerned about the burden it'll place upon a lot of the small businesses to do that, and that's not uncommon. I think other people have expressed that concern as well too. Uh, moving it through as quickly as it is, we'll see whether or not that, uh, how, how business can absorb that. I don't think it's a very good idea. I think that if you raise minimum wage, then it's going to, um, the prices are just going to go up anyway, so I don't think it almost doesn't really pay off. It's people going around living off of like barely nothing, and with the cost of everything going being raised every so often, like, wages should be raised with it too as well, right? So it's not really increasing the minimum wage, it's just increasing uh, how much more everything is going to cost for us while we get on with our lives. Welcome back to Your Turn. I'm Jenny Adams. We're in studio this evening with Ryan Jesperson of 630 Ched. So glad to have you here. And we're glad that you guys are texting and tweeting and calling in. So continue to keep that up. We're going to talk about Alberta. We heard it in the streeter questions. I heard it in studio today. We've been hearing it all week long. The minimum wage has really got people going. Yeah. The minimum wage increase. What are your thoughts on the increase? Boy, uh, okay, so the, here's the thing. So minimum wage was uh, $10.20 an hour, uh, which put um, Al Alberta, uh, it was not near the highest in the country. And, mm -hmm. and minimum wage, a lot of uh, anti-poverty advocates and, and those that, that make it their business to make sure that other people can succeed were saying $10.20 isn't even close yeah. to what a living wage needs to be like uh, here in the province of Alberta. They pin it actually right around $16 uh, dollars an hour. So the Alberta government, came in they made it a promise that they'd have a minimum wage of $15 within three years of receiving their mandate and the premier to her credit because we don't get yeah. to say this all the time this did day, what she, she said, said she, she would do. do and it's now uh, official as of last week down at the Alberta legislature minimum wage in Alberta will be the highest in Canada $15 an hour by 2018 so right now October 1st a bump up to mm -hmm. about 13 uh, uh, 12 20 first of all it went to 11 20 then 12 20 now it's going to 13 60 I believe and then it'll go to 15 uh, within the next three years so whether or not people believe this is a good or bad thing I suppose it remains to be seen you'll hear you'll hear some people saying uh, well, you know that, people that think it's a well a lot of people think it's a bad thing yeah. right but isn't that the truth consumers. isn't that exactly what's going to happen that you know if they have to pay people more either they're going to get rid of staff or they're going to charge me more for milk and charge me more for bread maybe and if i'm making minimum wage then how do i afford the uptick in yeah in the cost i don't know and plus yeah. i'm being taxed more now. all i know is that i haven't heard from a lot of minimum wage earners calling the show saying you know what i'm concerned that my costs are going to rise so i'd rather decline i'd rather like no yeah. one that's currently earning minimum wage no one's going to say don't pay me more speaks on behalf of minimum wage earners is stepping up and saying we think it's a bad idea should, should there be a 100 percent a maximum, maximum wage, wage? <laughs> yeah, yes absolutely we should all earn the exact same wage okay. and uh, no <laughs> no we're just trying to get people's attention now uh but but you know i I mean, I think that it says obviously employers don't want to pay their employees more. They're in the mm -hmm. business of profit. Um, I wouldn't say, though, that it's been 100% solidarity, business owners versus minimum wage earners. We've heard from some business owners that are saying, listen, I choose to pay my staff. Yeah. One guy well, told me the other day, I've paid my staff $15 an hour, uh, those at the entry-level jobs for two years now. And he said, I want my staff to want to work a lot of Albertan here. companies do, right? They do pay higher than the minimum wage. We do have a Twitter question, so we'll bring that up right now while we're on the topic of minimum wage. What do you see as challenges with the eggs? Um, okay, well, we're going to switch gears a little bit, yeah. but let's skip city council and go right to the provincial government. This is from S.J. Hamilton. Right on. Well, thanks for listening and thanks for watching. Uh, uh, challenges to the provincial government, man, oh, man. Uh, poof, where do you want to start? I, I mean, that's, that's a huge question, but, you know, one thing I would say is that this government, uh, the NDP government, if it wants to survive uh, in the next election, if it wants uh, another term, then it's going to have to be able to provide proof of performance and I think right now the race is on and it probably to a certain degree explains why some things have been if you put it casually rammed through why mm -hmm. the government has aggressively legislated some of the promises it made and some of the things it didn't promise like the carbon like levy the carbon, there was no talk the of that tax. when they were campaigning yeah, the levy, levy sorry, tax yeah. whatever you want to yeah. call it it's a tax uh, but but if the government can 
show can prove that what it's doing is not pure ideology and that it's actually improving the lives of Albertans. If, if, if business investment uh, is, is, if confidence is restored in the province of Alberta by the next time we go to the polls, if people can reasonably mm -hmm. uh, either associate or disassociate chance. things like world markets and the price of oil yeah. from what we can ra rationally expect from our politicians, uh, I think those are some of the biggest challenges facing this government. Well, and people don't go into uh, running for government because they want to destroy the economy or make people's lives worse. Of our not. current government is doing, trying to do the things that they believe in and they really believe in them. And so let's hope that for all of us that we do see some very good results. We have a phone call right now that I'd love to get to. This is Jim on the phone. Hi, Jim. Oh no. Jim's not here. Jim anymore. Jim didn't like my answer about the about the NDP's <laughs> biggest challenge. Well, hopefully Jim will call us back. But if okay, do you wish I mean in, in government we talked about some things that you know the current government promised some things that they didn't promise some things they promised they're like well we have to keep our promise um, they couldn't go back even if they wanted to because an opposition government would never let a politician retract on on a promise do you think well you have to think though I mean with with you know when you had the the progressive conservatives in power and the wild rose in opposition you had two small C conservative parties mm -hmm. and it was almost with respect I say this laughable three years ago for anyone to suggest that the NDP or the Liberals True. or the Alberta party for that matter mm -hmm. would would form a, a formidable opposition let alone a majority government yeah. Right now, you have uh, an NDP government with a wild rose opposition. They couldn't be further uh, from each other on the political spectrum. So, th so there, there's a great difference in ideology between Alberta's majority government and the opposition. So were the premier and her government to break election promises, it would probably be to the delight of the opposition. Of the course, opposition but would love for them to break their Don't you wish that promises. we would just if they say, you know what, here's my thing. Why do we have to do everything all at the exact same time? I think the carbon tax is a good idea. Because I think if increasing, you're but the premier and you think you only have three years, I know I you're understand that's the answer, but I as quickly as, as you quickly can. as you can. I just wish we didn't, so we didn't have to feel the impact all at once. We do have a call related to the minimum wage, so we'll go to the phone lines right now. Mm -hmm. I'm on Hi, Dean. Dean. They have to talk about things and then they. Hi, Hi Dean. Dean. How are you? You're on, Dean. I don't know if Dean can hear us. I want to talk about the minimum wage. Yeah, he wants to talk about the minimum wage. We know that. I don't think he can hear us. I don't think he can hear us. Mm -hmm. That's all right. We'll figure okay. it out. We'll try it out. We'll try okay. it again. Um, but but yeah. So this is. I mean, it's it's it's. Hello. It, I think it's a race for Dean? effectiveness. Hey, Dean. Yes. What's your question, Dean? Thanks for calling in. Yeah, just talking about uh, the minimum wage. You know, speaking uh, from the perspective of you know a small business owner and and somebody that uh, that's hiring Albertans and, and paying Albertans and creating jobs. Uh, you know, we don't pay minimum wage. We've never paid minimum wage. Um, I think that everybody deserves a livable wage. But what a lot of people aren't paying attention to, and I, th I think a lot of people are overlooking, is that even if people aren't being paid minimum wage, they are still going to have to have wages scaled. If a guy's making $15 an hour today, and in two years from now, minimum wage goes to $15 an hour, that same guy is not going to be working for $15 an hour. Those wages scale up. And a 34% increase over the next two years uh, in minimum wage, when your biggest line item uh, on your budget each year is labor, and for small businesses, you know, fast food outlets are, are a great uh, example, uh, food and beverage, when they're having to increase their labor cost by 34%. Yeah. That trickle down is massive. People are going to lose jobs. Costs are going to go up. No, it's a good point. How does an NDP government think that this is going to be, you know, workable for small business? Yeah, indeed. I mean, you're saying 34%. I mean, it's 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 a 50% raise over three years, right? From from 10, 20, it's roughly 50% mm -hmm. up to 15 bucks. So I certainly I, I hear Dean's point, and thanks for the call. That's a great call and a great point, yeah, and it's comment. undeniable because if somebody was making $15 an hour when minimum wage was 10, 20, uh, they're not going to be happy making 15 when everybody else is making, making 15. 15. They're going to want 20 yeah, or 22. Want they're going to want it to be proportionately higher than yeah. it was uh, compared to the previous minimum wage and, and Dean's bang on in that and, and 
people are concerned, of course they are. Uh, the fact of the matter is, like we said, though, this government is operating based on its conviction that people need to have, and we can have separate conversations about minimum wage and living wages as mm -hmm. well. I mean, some countries have, have experimented with it. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ontario, you know, they, they're, they're looking into the idea. Alberta has said as it's not close to the idea of a guaranteed living wage, which is a whole other conversation. It's a whole other conversation. We'll just leave that hanging out there with no comments on that. We have to have a quick break when we come back. Believe it or not, the next segment is called Hot Topics. I'm not sure what this one was in relation to that because it's all been a little fiery. Uh, stick around. We'll be right back after the break. Watch Edmonton's spirit of generosity in action. Galas and giving on Shaw TV, shining a spotlight on our community's charity scene. This is going to change the way palliative care is. Dressing up, changing lives. These are phenomenal events for a whole host of reasons. Coming together for a brighter future. I'm Heidi Johansson inviting you to watch Galas and Giving only on Shaw TV. Ever watch TV and said to yourself, I could do that? Well, you can. As part of its community access programming, Shaw TV is looking for volunteer run, community produced short segments and shows. Create your own program, your ideas, your vision on television. Bring us your proposal, sell us on it, and we'll train you and your crew, providing the professional equipment you need to make your ideas reality for free. Everyone is welcome. Get involved in making your own community program. See where it takes you. Welcome back to your turn. We're in studio this evening with Ryan Jesperson of 630 Ched. Ryan, we're going to talk about some hot topics and some things that have been popping up. And I'm going to let you choose which one you want to discuss, whether it be the Travis Vader verdict and the potential mistrial or the racism that we're dealing with Edmonton that we're seeing to seem pop up or the anti-oil sands, uh, head of our new oil sands committee. Which direction do you want to go? Or which, wow. which direction take do you, pick, I know, okay. <laughs> take your pick. Uh, yeah, well then I'm going to feel now that the, the, the two that I don't pick, uh, people will say, well, he's it's just for the sake of time. He's intentionally ignoring it's the sake them. Of time. Uh, why don't we do some quick hits on them? You're talking about Zipporah Berman, yeah. I assume, who's the co-chair of the Oil Sands Advisory Group, a university cool. of. I was listening uh, to your show this week. Yeah, you York mad, University you adjunct mad. professor, yep. anti-oil sands activist. Uh, I love that she's on the panel, and I think it's important that people like Zipporah are on that panel because the government needs to be able to say we can take the findings of this panel uh, and digest them with confidence because there was true diversity true. there. Yep. And so you have anti-oil sands activists, you have Indigenous Canadians, mm -hmm. Indigenous Albertans represented there, you have eight oil and gas executives on that panel. Half so of that panel, balance. oil she's and gas balance. executives. So I like it. With regards okay. to the Vader verdict, I think that people have a hard time right now having confidence in the Canadian judiciary. It's not just uh, Justice Denny Thomas kind of blowing it with Section 230 of the Criminal My Code. My hurts for him as well as the family. Of course. I mean. And Justice Robin Camp, his inquiry when he mm -hmm. told a sexual assault survivor, uh, you know, she should have kept her knees together. Uh, Graham James, given uh, full parole by the Parole Board of Canada just a short time ago. I think right now people are frustrated with with our judicial system and and rightfully so mm -hmm. I don't think Travis Vader is going to get his mistrial it's not my nope. opinion yeah. it's what legal experts have told me mm -hmm. but I do think he may be convicted on manslaughter as opposed to second-degree murder and the reason why that really matters is that with pretrial custody also factored in Travis Vader could be out of prison way before wow. most people are willing to accept it Wow. well that is heartbreaking and I know the family just wants closure and deserves closure and this is who you really feel for I mean yeah. the family of a murder victim them, they're victims themselves and they're never going to truly find closure mm -hmm. uh, but the fact that they weren't able to put this one to bed and move on with their lives they're still going to have to be back in court they're still going to be having to listen to testimony and, and, and you know their hearts will remain in their chests I'm sure the McCann family well I have a few more hot topics here I'm holding in my hands and you don't know what these subjects are and I want the first thing that you think about you can elaborate slightly but the first thing that you think about when you see uh, okay. these topics I'm about to hold up is what I'm going for here okay, okay? this is very fancy okay here we go. First one. City of Champions. City of Champions. We what still, are your thoughts on the City of Champions? Uh, we still are the City of Champions, and uh, I am happy to disagree with marketing experts in the yes, city. Yes, we're on the same page with that one. That it was a grave mistake to remove Taking City of Champions signs. from the Welcome to Edmonton signs. The Welcome to Edmonton signs look horrible, and we can replace those, but they, Edmonton is and will remain the City of Champions. Thank you. Agreed 100%. We thought we'd disagree on that one. I thought you would I disagree know, with but me. No, yeah. absolutely not. Okay. I'm going to put up my own signs. 
Donald, Donald versus, versus Hillary. Hillary. Uh, what do I say here? Uh, Who would you pick? Uh, well, I would I would try to determine the lesser of two evils, and uh, and in this case, I would vote for Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, um, agreed. Donald Trump is just making a mockery of the entire process, and some of the things well, he said are, are just are just too, too yeah. difficult to stomach. And uh, his understanding or his misunderstanding of foreign policy is just the first point, but it's a huge point, and that's not just with Mexico; it's with Canada too. Well, and at the end of the day, I'm all for people and the well-being of people over money and power and mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned there's two clearly opposite sides there mm -hmm. and, and what the, the obvious choice but anyway yeah, I'm politically incorrect is a politically correct way of saying I'm a racist <sighs> that's Donald Trump let that hit you for a let, second we'll let that hit you for a second and then we'll switch to this very hot topic Brad, Brad versus, versus Angelina. Angelina I'm just so excited that Brad and Jen can get back together now this is very did exciting. you see the New York I wish we had a picture of it the the cover of the New York Times newspaper the next day yeah there was something about it was just a huge picture, a huge of, picture Jennifer of Jennifer Aniston no it was a huge picture of Jennifer oh, Aniston her. laughing oh. just laughing hysterically and I thought this isn't the New York New York Post, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Probably not the New the York Post. The Post is an interesting. Yeah, the New York Post. I shouldn't get those two confused because yeah. they're very different. So, anyway, Brad versus Angelina. Oh, I have to pick an allegiance? Well, uh, actually, don't. There's Brad Pitt. I said to my buddies, Brad Pitt is a guy. Pitt is like Clooney. I know, but. They're you, supposed to be single. You probably didn't hear what came out today on oh, TMZ. Okay, sorry. So, you probably don't want to side with him. Oh, really? Um, there was some allegations of. Um, some misconduct physical, yeah, exactly so let's okay. stick with that Oilers prospect for this season yeah hot topic yeah I'm just supposed to tell you what I'm excited about what, well, what do you think I'm I think that I think that this team is gonna hit its stride and I'm so excited to see uh, Connor McDavid uh, I speculate I don't know uh, that he'll be wearing the C I don't know who else you'd possibly give it to and, and I'm excited to see what this Pugliarvi kid is all about mm -hmm. Jesse Pugliarvi some people uh, think that he's just gonna be a great top six forward and some people think he's gonna be a great one so we'll wait and see I'm gonna pretend I know a lot about hockey but I really don't Mm, that's okay. Last one. Dream job. Dream job. Doing it. You're doing it? Yeah. This, was this, this wasn't the plan, but you're doing it. Doing it. So there's no plan next? Well, I mean, ask me when next happens. <laughs> well, I, I know uh, we've got a Twitter question from uh, Steve Kwasney. I think that it was come up in it. He did ask you, would um, Ryan ever run for politics? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm experimenting with talk radio now and really enjoying it and really sort of feeling like we've caught a wave and, and we're surfing the barrel right now. And, and as soon as that barrel closes and the ocean swallows me up, then, then uh, we'll see. It's been suggested that there are too many pictures from my university days out there to allow for a political it's, it's career to thrive. It's time to start deleting You those. saw one of them earlier in the show. <laughs> it's true. The, the unfortunate blonde hair. People, it's true, you know, but you know, you were in university before Facebook and thank God. YouTube and thank God. I've had something in my past that was yeah. on TV that didn't exist when that stuff was around too right. so we might be in the clear you might be okay okay here all we right go. we're gonna have one quick break and when we come back we've got our last segment we're gonna learn a little bit more about Ryan and what makes him tick thanks for sticking with us we'll see you after the break Sometimes in live TV, we have water bottles sitting on here, the table. Here, here we're just going to throw those. That's what's so fun about TV. Anyway, you there caught you us. Go. You caught us. Welcome back to your turn. It's uh, Jenny Adams with Ryan Jesperson of 630 Ched. 
We were talking a little bit about the Oilers, and I want to talk about your life on the big screen as the, what is your official title? The, it's, it's now the biggest screen it's the uh, biggest in North screen. America is it blue and maybe the world. Blue line? Uh, yeah, the, this, this new uh, Jumbotron, the, the, I don't know if it's the brand, I think Jumbotron is a brand, okay. but, but the new big scoreboard at, uh, at uh, Rogers Place is, is 46 feet uh, in like absolute high definition. I can't quite described here you can see it I mean this thing is is a behemoth this thing is a monster How do you look it's on that? absolutely Have you seen amazing yourself on there yet? Uh, I've been I've been uh, on Ryan. a juice diet and running the Glenora <laughs> stairs every day so Ryan if you don't know is the in-game host for yeah, the Oilers right. game so if you're at a game you will hear Ryan you'll see him on the big screen doing the TV times out and kind of hosting the evening so. yeah very much looking forward to it and I know that everybody that works there uh, the crew behind the scenes and everybody that participates in you know putting this fan experience together off the ice yeah. is really excited even about some of the new capabilities on there that was st patrick's day a couple of years ago <laughs> on the ice and 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 you know just i mean bob cole unbelievable to have him there at, at rexall place that was the uh that was either the farewell to rexall place game or that might have been the glenn sather tribute night but that was that was another special night some, some wonderful memories closing out rexall, rexall. place but rogers place is going to be a whole so new experience for exciting. people exciting i've yeah. had the opportunity to host the oilers games a few yeah. times myself the in-game stuff and i I get nervous for everything, but between TV, radio, and, and then that live audience of 15,000 people listening and responding yeah. to you, does that throw yeah, you like off? 18 does, or 18.5 now, does that get butterflies in your stomach, even as a seasoned pro, or are you just kind of like... Well, you're, you know, you, you sort of, uh, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're, you're in it with the fans. You know, there's nights, there have been nights that are, that are a little more difficult to get everybody excited, and then there yeah. are nights where you just sit back and shut up and, and let the crowd speak for itself. So, uh, you know, it's been, it's been neat to see this team start to mature and grow and and I get the sense and I know that I'm not alone here in Edmonton that, that this year is going to be you know it's not just the new arena I think I think that you know I'm not going to make any bold predictions here with regards yeah, to how the team does it, okay. uh, but but I think that I think that the tide is turning a little bit and I think it's going to be an exciting one okay well we have a Twitter question about the arena so we'll pull that up on screen Taxpayers own the arena building. Why can't we pick the name for the arena? Well, yeah, I mean, of course, the naming rights are are, are for sale, yeah. and that's a way that, that uh, they generate revenue. They generate but, revenue. Um, you know, that's. Not, I'd be I interested mean, to know what uh, Camille thanks for the tweet, Camille. What would you name it? Do you have any ideas? Yeah, you that's a good it? one. I, I saw that uh, Mac Mail, who does the Master Mac blog, which is an excellent one if you're trying to you know figure out you know some insight on civic issues, uh, posted photos that the that the Northlands Coliseum is now the Northlands Coliseum again. Yeah. Uh, the signs are back up oh, on, on the oh, exterior of the building as of today. And uh, and a lot of people yeah. like that it's, yeah, that it's back to the Northlands Coliseum. You know, there, are, there have been cities that have named their uh, arenas in a, in a non-naming rights situation, but right now Certainly companies are so generator. willing to pay big money. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it's, it's so prominent it. as you're driving down 104th. It's, uh, yeah. it's amazing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your beautiful family. Oh, sure. I'd your love lovely to. wife, Carrie Skelton, also in media herself, and then your son, Wyatt. I think we have some photos of this man. How has life been transitioning? Here they are right here. Yeah, oh, this was so a, a photo that Larry Wong shot for us. It was in the Edmonton Journal for a, a feature they were doing on a sleep coach that we hired uh, to teach little Wyatt how to sleep or to teach us to teach Wyatt how to sleep. And uh, it was just a really incredible uh, experience to see how he really latched on and learned quickly. Friends of ours had, had hired this sleep coach and we worked with her. And it and, worked. Uh, and he sleeps 12 hours a night. I, some people are gonna hate me for saying that, but it's true. Well, you got a little help and sometimes if you know the tricks. Yeah. Do you have any tips for people? If uh, what your biggest parenting tip? that you might have oh wow uh, you know I'm probably not the one to ask because well, what I'm, would still, I'm still I'm still I'm still wide-eyed and, and on my heels but I just you know I guess my one piece of advice if, if you want me to speak from the heart and be serious is put your phone down and and spend time with oh, your little one people truth. keep saying to me that the baby and toddler phase is over so quickly uh, sometimes it can't be over soon enough but it's over so quickly and you want to enjoy it while you can and really take it in and, and I don't want to be the dad that's always on his phone but it's it's easier said than done isn't it I mean it's we, so easy it's so hard for us to put my son away. said to us uh, this week, what did he say? He said, oh, look, I look just like mummy. And he had his iPad and on the, cat, right. the couch. And I'm like, oh, put put it away yeah. but like Did, was he carrying a bottle of wine around the house too <laughs> yeah, or not exactly no. mom look wine's on sale <laughs> yeah um but as a busy parent and it, you know i know carrie's juggling many different things building this great career yourself you're juggling the oilers and your career and and we have businesses it's you know these things can be such a detriment but mm -hmm. i often say to myself well at least i can be at home with them i may have to look at my phone and respond to things but at least i can be there rather than be you know in an office all the time kind of responding to things so i don't know i'm trying to make myself feel better right now no i think i think you're 
there, that's the way it is. Yeah. You know, and we all try to manage in our own lives, and everybody's busy, and we know that. And I think you just, you know, you figure this out as as you go, what works for you and what works for your family. And and I think, you know, I mean, conversations like we're having right now are conversations that people need to have around their family dinner tables and and while they go for walks. I mean, you know, I was never a dog guy growing up. I never had a dog growing up. But we have a dog now, and. One of the, I mean, aside from the richness that he brings to our lives, the fact that he gets us out and walking every day yeah. through our neighborhood where we wouldn't otherwise is when we have some of these conversations about what the priorities for our family need to be and how we achieve them. Yeah. And it's important to Getting talk about the that same kind page. Of stuff. Oh, it absolutely is. Um, you know, I want to talk just a little bit about your show a little bit more because I meant to ask you this in the hot topic section. There was a time that I was tuning in listening. I do listen quite frequently if you don't notice. Thank I, you. I send you a lot of tweets and notes. Um, but you were yelling... At the, uh, you may have yelled into the microphone. I think I was. I think I was really projecting. You were projecting. It was almost like a, we're taking a break. Do you mm. remember what the topic was on that? I. Uh, yeah, I, rem I does that remember, happen often? I remember doing it, uh, yeah. and and that's my answer to does it happen often because because I remember uh, doing it. I don't remember what the topic was, was but I was so. Uh, you know, here's the thing: uh, when, when when you host or when you moderate a talk radio program, and people can, and you're very reachable on purpose. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a text line; people can get at you directly. That monitor you see there on the left, that's our text line, and it's like a stock ticker. It just it just mess puts messages scrolling through us as they come in. And sometimes it's 100 messages an hour, and sometimes it's you know 800 messages an hour. Uh, and and sometimes some of the nastiness. And, and I don't really care about nastiness directed at me, that's fine, but sometimes some, some of the comments can just become so frustrating and you have to be very careful uh, to, to remind yourself that one person does not make the four million that it's comprise the, thick the population skin that you build. of our province. You but know? do you have a few people who regularly are texting you trying yeah. to throw oh, yeah. you off of your course. game? And of course. There was it, a one time I remember I was almost I had this comment on Ryan's show. It was hilarious because I you if you're sitting in a studio and you're watching, you can see the text screens if you, if your eyes are good enough. And I did this and I said, "What?" I was so mad. And I was and trying we to hide it. He was trying you. to hide it. And uh, some some gentleman told me that I should get back to work or sorry, I shouldn't be working and having a business. I should get back to parenting my kids. Yeah. And that's what I should be doing. And I actually challenged him to meet me in the parking lot for a fist fight because that's just really how I felt and they did in the fight. moment. And, and Jenny did. Well for herself. <laughs> I did well for myself, but I mean, obviously, I had that knee-jerk reaction, and we kind of laughed about it. I had some people stick up for me. We moved along in the conversation, but you have to certainly be a pro to be able to handle situations. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, like I'll be honest. Um, the moment where, if, if it's the one that you're talking about, where I actually was banging my you're head banging, on the to make banging, a point, yeah. and and there was a little bit of showmanship to that. Um, you don't want to manufacture passion. I don't think you can. I think it's a smart listening audience. You have smart viewers. People know if you're being sincere or if you're not. Mm -hmm. And if you pick your spots properly, uh, you, you know you can you can get worked up. People like the passion, but you can't do it every day. You know there are talk radio hosts that are professionally angry, and they're angry every single day. And I just don't buy it. Yeah. Uh, how are you always angry? Uh, sometimes I'm going to talk to somebody about their favorite pizza toppings, and sometimes I'll talk to someone about their biggest fears. You uh, but, had, yeah. you know, you have to be able to sort of process it. You had the sweetest little old lady on your show, and she came in with all of her papers, and she was on for a boat. Ruth Adria. Hour. Ruth. From the Elder Advocates oh, of Alberta. Was yeah. she, she ever is wonderful. great at what she was talking yeah, about? Yeah, and it. she was feeling, um, and had been feeling for quite some time, that, that the uh, Alberta's senior citizens were being marginalized and ignored, uh, and that they weren't getting the attention from government and from the public uh, that they needed, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and we invited Ruth to come in studio and just talk to me for an hour and it was absolutely compelling and it wasn't something and 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 I, I don't mean to come across too candid but it wasn't just a, a cute little old no. lady being cute Ruth is sharp she was and she was prepared it. and she is on it and she's not afraid to lock horns with policymakers and movers and shakers yep. and I was totally impressed and uh, she inspired our audience that morning well I hope I'm like that how old was she? Was she in her 80s? I hope I continue I, to... A wise person once told me never, never speculate. Asked. I was texting people. I'm like, you have to tune in. You have to listen to Ruth. This, this she woman was incredible. is unbelievable. She was great. She was unbelievable. And you know when she, when she got 
to be her best on the radio, and this happens all the time, was when she took all the papers in front of her and she just pushed them away and she just spoke from her heart. Yeah. You know, people on the radio, people on shows like this, uh, statistics are important to arguments and sometimes facts obviously are imperative, uh, but sometimes people just want to know what do you care about and why? Yeah. You know, a friend of mine had a t-shirt in university that said, I yell because I care and I love it. <laughs> well, we were talking a little bit on your show today or you were speaking about how sometimes with talk radio, you just get, get it gets heavy. It's a mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. and this is your job that you do every day. Well, when we have conversations about things like childhood sexual abuse and domestic violence and, and soaring unemployment and drug addiction and legalizing prostitution, and, and these are not easy conversations to have, but they're very important conversations to have. So my job is very difficult and my job is very easy at the same time. At the same time. Well, you're so very good at it, and I wanted to segue into how you relax and get a little R&R, &R, and you literally go from the heavy to the out in the wilderness, mm. in the mountains. You want to tell us a little bit about sure. this trek that you went on? Because it sounded like I'd love to do it if I could ever detach myself from my phone. Yeah, well, how much time do I have? Yeah. I mean, I could, well, I could talk to you. We have some photos that we the, can bring uh, up this here, is, yeah. Uh, these are, yeah. These are three members of the Outdoorsman Social Club. And for the last seven summers, uh, we've hiked together uh, through different mountain ranges and, and facing different challenges. Uh, we started with the West Coast Trail out on uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island. And then we've hoped, uh, hiked, uh, I mean, for, for your listeners that know and that spend time in the mountains, uh, the Moose River route, the Sawback Range Circuit, the Brazo Circuit, uh, this right here, uh, we hiked into Mount Assiniboine, uh, that was last year, uh, and, uh, and this year we hiked the, uh, it's called the North Molar uh, Pipestone Dolomite Circuit, okay. uh, just off the, uh, the Icefields Parkway, just off Highway 93, uh, three mountain passes, uh, it's about 90 kilometers uh, the route that we did, but about 35 kilometers of that is above the tree line so it's a completely wow. different high alpine yeah. experience and we saw some serious storms and whipping winds really? and snow we woke up to eight inches of snow one morning and uh, you're prepared for all of that see this is so very prepared foreign as you to can me. be <laughs> yeah. uh, you know we 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 require these annual expeditions to break us as men so it can build us up again and that's hmm. exactly what so we earn the right to reminisce with pride and uh <laughs> but i'll tell you don't feel too sorry for us uh, you know we, we hike with five or six bottles per guy poured into plastic um, uh, uh, we have red wine and scotch in the evenings we reel in big rainbow trout and we you were burn telling fires me it was something you were cooking and uh, it was just wonderful so what some of the guy one of the guys saved up some yeah well we we don't so we're, we're not like your typical hikers where they'll, they'll go to get their their weight down on their pack as much as possible some guys are hiking with 35 or 40 pounds uh, our packs are typically 75 or 80 pounds when we set out but that's because we hike with with things that make no sense Sense, yeah. Like full, you know, big red onions and lemons and tartar sauce and and, and and you know pot dry rub for the trout and and things like that. People think it's a travesty. We use tr tartar sauce on fresh Rocky Mountain <laughs> trout. We don't slather each one in that. But it, but it's all for us part of the experience and uh, and and the camaraderie and, and what it does for us. It's our spiritual journey. No, oh, that's great. Good for you guys. Mm -hmm. We have um, one minute or so left. Any final thoughts from you on Alberta, Edmonton, hot topics, Brad? And Angelina, I love, I'm going to steer clear of Brangelina if, if you don't mind, um, <laughs> but I will say uh, it's been an honor to be here in the Shaw studio and work with your excellent crew and, and sit here with you because you are prioritizing what we prioritize at 630 Chet as well, and that's conversation and, and, uh, and, and being unafraid to encounter and address topics mm -hmm. that not everybody agrees on. And right now there are stories of racism and, and political disagreement, but what really matters, what really matters is that we keep our perspective and keep talking to one another and uh, and keep showing love to one another and I think that it all starts with conversations like these. No, I completely agree. It's it's talking about things, it's having conversations about things, making things seem like they're not okay and making it awkward like we were talking about a little bit today, yeah, but I, it's like people ask me all the time, how can I get involved? How can I'm like have a conversation with your neighbor, listen to the radio, tune into the newspaper, find something that t talks to and you. And we need and to remind you. ourselves as well. We see a lot of ugliness. We see ugliness in, in the political arena. We see it on Facebook. We see people arguing and fighting on other forms of social media like Twitter. But we need to remind ourselves there are a lot of people that aren't ugly. There are a lot of people that, that feel more. the love there's and there's more, more to with it. With great intentions. So yeah. anyway, Ryan, thanks for coming thanks, into our Jenny. studio thanks this evening. Me. This was really fun. Thank you to all of you for contributing this evening. Uh, it was great to have you on the show and great to have Ryan here. We look forward to the next time. Thanks for joining.